you were involved in the introduction of theory into English departments. Could you define what theory is? Well, do you want the short answer or the long one? The, the short answer would be, I suppose, that theory is thinking about practice. In other words, not just doing whatever you habitually do, but reflecting about it and self-consciously choosing to do it a particular way. But the word theory has become, this is a longer version, has become a sort of shorthand for a particular take on language, a particular interest in the way language works. And um, I think the, the theory that's been prevailing in the last 20 or 30 years, which is my, my heyday, uh, is um, one that insists that language is not transparent, but opaque. That's to say that what we need to do is not look behind it or beyond it or the other side of it, but at it, especially if we're critics, if we're in an English, on an English course. That's our main preoccupation. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so to go off that, what, what differences do you think applying theory makes? To, uh, well, to the, the English course in the first instance, I think it means that instead of looking, as people used to, behind the play or the poem or the novel for the author and what the author might have had in mind, you look at it and bracket the author. The author really is of no interest any longer. Uh, not that, that the work doesn't have an author, but the easy assumption that you can translate what the author was doing into what the text means, that I think has really disappeared. And I think the other difference it's made is that instead of looking the other side of the text for the characters as if they were real people or the, for their motives and their intentions and what they're really thinking, uh, we look at what the text says about them and find that it's sometimes contradictory, sometimes obscure, sometimes difficult. And that's our, our job, to disentangle or, or respect the tangles, depending on how you go at it, of the, the, the text itself sets up. Well, my question is more to do with your work. Mm. I read a review by Jeannie Howard on the critical practices of Catherine Balsey. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Where did you find that? Oh, everything's online still. Oh, right, <laughs> okay. Do your little research. Um, and she said in it that your lucid prose allows even an undergraduate with a little effort to be able to understand the concepts that you discuss. So it was something that resonated with me as an undergraduate student, especially a first year, because the way you write allows me to understand complex terms that like Barth and Lacan comes up with. Mm -hmm. I just wondered whether you feel it is what is considered to be your lucid prose that makes your work so available to so many and to understand and the speed of success of it is. That was the idea, that was my initial plan, to make it accessible because for different and very good reasons the theorists that we borrow from in these, in these ways, uh, those theorists write in a difficult, impenetrable pro well, not impenetrable, it's penetrable, but it's hard. And it seems to me not a place to start. I, I had to start, but the way we did it in my day was a group of staff, young staff we were, uh, who were interested in this stuff, would read, say, a seminar of Lacan, and assemble on Thursday at five o'clock and say, what, did, could you make anything of this at all? And between us, we would try and struggle to come to some sort of interpretation. Well, it, I'm not sure how successful we were, but there weren't any introductions at that time. That's really what I'm getting at. So it seemed to me that if students were going to have a crack at that, they needed some help. And so what I thought I'd learned from this process, I could pass on. Uh, and I'm glad if it works. I I'm delighted if, if it is intelligible. There's just one 
danger with intelligibility, and that is that it may be that I simplify. In order to make it intelligible, I also iron out some of the difficulties. You see what I mean? That, so what I deeply wanted, really, was to make what I was doing introductory in the sense that it was an introduction to something. In other words, I hope that in due course, not necessarily next week, but as graduate students or whatever, the, my readers would go on to read the real thing and not just settle for me. Uh, I, I did my best not, not to make sacrifices, I mean, not to betray the original, but the, as you know, from the opacity of language, from what we just talked about, if you put it in different words, you say something different. And I put it in different words. I put it in more accessible words. So um, there's always a nuance of difference between my version of it and the original. And sometimes, sometimes I made mistakes, there are big differences. But um, I've tried with second editions to correct those as best I can. So that was the plan, and I'm glad if it's, I'm just glad if it's true. It would definitely yeah. help with my work, <laughs> yes. I think especially with Lacan and Derrida for me. Yes. Well, see, both of them, I mean, one of the things we could have said, how long have we got? One of the things we <laughs> could have said about the new take on language and the difference it makes, coming back to your question, is that we now think of um, texts, works, utterances, writing as constructing an addressee, producing an, a reader or addressed to a particular position. Uh, and Bart was writing for people with a heritage, French, of literary criticism that we don't have and a heritage in psychoanalysis that we don't have. Lacan, much more difficult to my mind, was actually addressing an audience of psychoanalysts. And therefore, he wanted them to listen to him as they would listen to their... Yeah, I think it's Robin mentioned how Lacan wanted his work to be like you're actually deciphering a patient rather than yes. just being literally told what, he, right. what he wanted to say. Exactly. It's like you've got to decipher the meaning yourself exactly. rather than it just being... Delivered. That's spot on, absolutely right. So, so when I'm translating that, you see that I am betraying quite a lot. Be because he was addressing a group of people he could assume had some knowledge of the vocabulary, but he also wanted to get them to somewhere different from where they were, from, from being, let's say, standard Freudians to being Lacanians, and it's not the same. Uh, and so he's taking for granted certain assumptions in his audience. Mm. And we, coming to that from a background in, in first of all, not French theory, <laughs> second, not necessarily Freud much, and third, uh, English literature, we've, we've got all sorts of hurdles and obstacles that need to be overcome. So that's what I mean, I think, about that it's possible to betray stuff, not because you mean to, but because if you tr take it out of its context and translate it for somebody from a different context or construct a different addressee, in other words, then you are doing something different, even though you don't mean to betray anything. I wanted to ask the question of what challenges are posed by cultural criticism and why do you think they're so important? Right. Well, uh, I suppose... To my mind, cultural criticism is the broad thing, where English is the specific and narrow thing. So there's a syllabus in English, which might include Thomas Hardy and Virginia <laughs> Woolf, to name a couple of people at random, might include uh, fiction of various kinds that, we've, that the institution has already classified as suitable to be on an English course, i.e. literature. And cultural criticism spreads its net a great deal wider to use some of the same strategies, the opacity of language, the constructing of a, a position for the addressee and so on, in order to look at just absolutely any cultural phenomenon, whatever. So you could 
tackle crime fiction or popular romance, Mills and Boone. I actually contributed to human happiness on the topic of popular romance. Um, it, and, and find things that other people might not because they're not coming at it with this theoretical assumption. But it goes wider than that. And I've been thinking about the slogans that people are exchanging in the immigration debate that's going on at the moment. And I was looking, for example, at, well, not looking, but I, mean, I was thinking about the way people keep on saying, the anti-immigration people keep on saying, this country is full up. And I thought, what's going on there? What? OK, we could discuss whether it's true or not. We could discuss whether there are any spaces. We could discuss whether we shouldn't just spend more money on a and &E and then the problem would go away. But that's not quite what a cultural critic, I think, would do. I think a cultural critic might, for example, say, what is the metaphor here? I think we're talking about buses, aren't we? What's full up and you can't board it safely? A bus. OK, so what kind of addressee is this slogan? constructing a person of the people who travels by down to a public transport, <laughs> goes on buses, not a posh boy who doesn't know the price of a pint of milk, and so on. It's, it's saying we're ordinary people and we know the score, we know that it's sensible that we can't take any more people on this bus. But of course the difference when you start to think about it is that a bus goes on without you and another one comes along in 10 minutes, but there isn't necessarily another country coming along in 10 <laughs> minutes to... So it, 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 that would be the kind of thing a cultural critic might want to follow up, something very ordinary and non-literary and not on the syllabus of a traditional English department, but nonetheless interesting in the way that it works and persuades people and actually doesn't hang together when you, when you pursue it, but sounds plausible at first blush. That sort of thing. So uh, we, we actually, we did it in Cardiff. We had a cultural criticism degree and we had the students uh, at the end of their first term, they wrote essays on any cultural object they chose and they chose Barbie dolls and shampoo bottles and uh, yeah. packets of tea and paintings from Tate Modern and uh, they just ranged widely and it was absolutely fascinating. So that, that's what I think it is and that's where I think it might go. But of course it's a quite tall order because what it's really doing is reuniting English on the one hand and cultural studies on the other which have been institutionally divided which I think is, is a pity. I think they belong together.